and we are live. Um, uh, okay. Uh, let's let's just go. Okay, so uh, I I'll get the pleasure to 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 begin this. Uh, we have with us uh, Jeffrey West. Uh, Jeffrey is a professor at the Santa Fe Institute uh, in uh, uh, New Mexico. And in order, instead of just reading a long list of all of his accomplishments from his CV, we thought that it would be fun to introduce him by uh, a, a short interview. So we'll start just by asking you, Jeffrey, how did you get interested in science in the first place? Or, or tell us where you're from and how you got into science. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so let's see. First of all, you should know that I'm, uh, I'm, in, I'm rigid, but I still am. I'm English, British. I was born in England and raised in England. And uh, I came to the United States uh, when I was 20 years old to go to graduate school. I went to Stanford, and, uh, but I had a very little intention of continuing with science, even though, now to answer your question, I had become very interested when um, uh, probably already when I was about 10 or 11, maybe 12 years old, I, I became very interested in science. Um, and that, that um, expanded during high school. And so when I went to college, I majored in physics. But I can tell you, I'll just have one anecdote about that um, that, uh, w that, that really inspired me. And that was um, in a, when I was learning trigonometry in school. It turns out where, I where we lived then was on the south coast of England. And uh, you've probably seen pictures of uh, the White Cliffs. You know, there's the famous White Cliffs yes. at the and so on. Uh, so, you know, outside of the town on the coast, uh, these cliffs rose. And one of the great things was to go to the top of the cliffs, look over the ocean and so on. And um, this relates to a problem, a, a homework problem that we were given in trigonometry. And that is to determine, knowing the radius of the Earth, how far the horizon is. Ah. And, <laughs> and this is when I was about 12 years old, I think. I forget exactly the age, maybe 11, just learning trigonometry. And I, first, you know, when I saw that question, I thought, Jesus Christ, that's how, how in the hell can you do that? Then, of course, as soon as you draw a picture and you do sort of as usual, you make a little diagram, it became clear how you do it. And it was very simple, actually. And uh, it was remarkable. And so I could determine from the height of the cliff, I was mean, just to make it now personal, how far away the ships were when they went over the horizon. And that just totally intrigued me because what I realized in that moment that there was an algebraic formula that was, I mean, in my sort of semi-conscious state as a 12-year-old, <laughs> that there was a formula that described not just me standing on top of that particular cliff, looking at that particular ship going over the horizon, but at any height of any cliff, for any horizon, on a sphere. And I thought, my God, that is mind-blowing that you can have this sort of generality. And even though it wasn't quite conscious, really, I think that inspired me about the power of mathematics and then by um, sort of extrapolation, the power of scientific thinking and of analysis. And, uh, and, and even more so that it really inspired me in terms of thinking about universalities, something that is beyond the particular. And that has sort of dominated my scientific career, actually, in terms of my own thinking. Although I have to just say that many of the problems I worked on were excruciating detail, uh, various <laughs> problems. But it was always in order to get to something bigger. But that was a major, a major, I don't know, experience, may I say, um, in inspiring me. So I became interested in science at about that time, at about that age. And it turned out I was very good at mathematics. And so uh, it, that helped. Uh, and then I went to college. But by the way, just to finish that story, um, I went to college and became, uh, and, and uh, I enjoyed physics. I did mathematics first and then moved to physics. Um, 
But um, I could not see myself as a physicist. I, I just felt, uh, I, I, A, I wouldn't be good enough. And secondly, it wasn't that exciting. Uh, but I wanted to go to California. And the easiest way, <laughs> and since I came from a rather poor family, um, the only way I could do it was to go to graduate school and get them to pay. So I went for one year to Stanford, assuming that I would then return home and do something different. Uh, but I got inspired during that year. I got re-inspired. And by nice. the way, and one of the reasons I, I, I really wanted, I'm, I'm very open to talking to students, was that my, the reason I got inspired wasn't the professors. Um, in spite of the fact that that first, after two months being there, a man named Robert Hofstadter in the department, whom I got, wow. to bit, got the Nobel Prize. You'd think that would be inspirational. But it turns out it wasn't, especially because it was a terrible lecturer. But what, what inspired me that year were the other students, was the other students and talking to each other and explaining things and, you know, the usual things that often graduate groups of graduate students do, and I'm assuming you guys do. And that was so extraordinary to me, those kinds of conversations and so on, that I... I decided, you know, by the end of that year, I was going to stay doing physics. And by nice. the way, I did extremely well in the exams, and that helped my ego. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But it was mostly the other students. The students were were fantastic. So you were, if I remember correctly, you were in particle physics, and you actually had a pretty successful career uh, in Los Alamos, if I remember correctly? Yeah, my, uh, yeah so um, I, I, I got my uh, PhD in uh, particle physics, high energy physics, basically. Um, and uh, then um, I went to Cornell, then Harvard, and then I returned to Stanford. Um, and then I was there a few years and uh, I was, I suppose, recruited is the word is used nowadays. Uh, to Los Alamos to start a new um, high energy theory group. There was um, an experimental group, but there was there was a little bit of high energy physics theory, but not very much. And they we wanted to start. Uh, there was this uh, uh, idea to start a new one, and we put together a marvelous group, actually, and that was very exciting. And I stayed there for almost to my. I, I went by the way. I left Stanford to go to Los Alamos, thinking that I would at least go back to California, if not Stanford, <laughs> after two years, because I like California a lot. And, I, and, I, and somehow two years turned into almost 30. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and we had this wonderful group, um, of, uh, which, was, which was quite eclectic, quite broad, um, that even though it was, folk, of course, it was doing high energy physics. But yes, so in our, your, a short answer would have been yes <laughs> to your question. I did high energy physics, particle physics. Well, it seems from the story that you were telling us that all of the plans of how long you're going to stay in a place doesn't seem to come to... No, <laughs> Maybe that's not the case. And then I guess, you know, the, uh, for, for, the, for the people listening, uh, we, the reason we wanted to talk to Geoffrey is because we've been doing this book club uh, and we read uh, his amazing book, uh, A Scale. And... You know, it's not about the standard model. It's not about anything like that. So it's about metabolism and cities and companies, seemingly disconnected phenomena. So how did you get interested in the first place in all of these uh, topics? By the way, uh, maybe I'll come back to this, but that book originally, um, in my uh, sort of proposal for that book, the last part of that book was to show how all of that stuff biological metabolism and cities and uh, companies and so on and growth of organisms and so on were connected to high energy physics. <laughs> was the, was the, <laughs> but the book got too long and I stopped. And, uh, but <laughs> so the, re the way I got into it was I'd always been interested, you know, I always had very uh, great interest in problems across science. Um, and uh, and I went into high energy physics, particle physics, uh, because of this desire for, you know, that many of us do when we're young, to sort of deep understanding, trying to understand the laws of nature, how everything works, and so on and so forth. Um, and high energy physics, and, and the fact that I was good at mathematics, 
and it, it was all it was theoretical um it was very natural to um, uh, migrate into that field um but um i was always interested in its connections to other things and i would just say parenthetically one of my disappointments um, in my career as particle physics was that it because of the nature of academia and maybe the nature of modern life is that you i was forced always to do you know very specific things and things mm. specifically and um you know that's a little bit of inevitability but um it's uh it's a shame and uh, and so uh, but i always kept my ears and eyes open for interesting problems which I would sort of do back of the envelope calculations on just the orders of magnitude. But one of the things that began to intrigue me, especially as I got into my 50s, was um, aging and mortality, death. I, got, I, I always uh, had a, a morbid interest in death. Uh, it intrigued me as to the fact that, I mean, it seems simplistic and naive, but you're born and then you die. And somehow, <laughs> why is that? I mean, <laughs> that's the nature of life. And um, and so I, I was I was always had a certain interest in that. But um, so what triggered me to become seriously interested uh, was, and I tell this in the book, um, the demise of something called the superconducting supercollider, uh, the so-called SSC, which was this enormous accelerator for particle physics that was be, going to be built in Texas. And it was, um, uh, it was going to cost, uh, I know, at the beginning about $12 billion, something like that. Very large amount of money, enormous amount of money. But anyway, after many discussions and arguments, and after $3 billion was spent during the <laughs> Clinton administration, it was stopped. And, uh, and uh, there was at the same time, uh, and part of that was, especially in the United States, but it was almost global, was a sort of negativity towards science in general. This is in the 90s, by the way, I'm sorry. Mm. This is in the 90s. Um, uh, th there was sort of negativity towards science and basic research, and in particular towards physics. And uh, the, the kind of statements that were heard, um, which is, were, Things like uh, the one I always used to hear was uh, physics was the science of the 19th and 20th century, um, and, but the science of the 21st century would be biology. And the corollary to that was there's no need to do any more physics. We know all the physics we need to know, period, finished. And that was sort of crazy, I thought. I, I thought this is nuts. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, and, and, and I, and I reacted because I was actually involved in the superconducting supercollider. I reacted in in <laughs> by first of all saying it's nuts um, uh, that we need physics, but also that um, as far as I was concerned, biology wasn't yet a science. It was because you know I still had the, you know I knew no biology by the way. This is a completely ridiculous statement of mine. I knew no biology, but I said it's obviously not a science because it's mostly. You know, it's mostly qualitative and narrative, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, I would read these papers and I couldn't see a single equation anywhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to me, that meant that it wasn't an explanation, and there was no quantitative prediction, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and so I had a very jaundiced view of biology, and I started saying, well, look, if biology were a serious science, it would predict these things quantitatively. And indeed, if it's to become a serious science, it would need to incorporate, not necessarily physicists, but some of the paradigm of physics and certainly some of the mathematics and the way of thinking of physics. That is this marvelous interface between theory, between the big picture and detailed calculations, inspiring experiments, inspiring having and even the idea of toy models, simple models to understand very complicated things. You know, none of that seemed to be part of biology, but I knew not, by the way, I, <laughs> I didn't know any biology. <laughs> uh, so it was really arrogant and, and stupid of me to say that. However, having now worked in biology, 
for 20 years and work with biologists. And some people have even called me a biologist. What I said was in spirit correct, I, I believe, by the way. <laughs> it's provocative and, and so on. But anyway, but so I said the following to myself. Look, um, if biology were a serious science, it ought, that you ought to better pick up I have books back in over there in the, on biology, a big fat book in biology, and there should be a little calculation in it that does a bunch of things and then says, therefore, the lifespan of a human being should be of the order of 100 years, period. Well, you look in all these biology books, it doesn't even talk about aging and mortality. It doesn't even mention it. This is the second most important event in any organism's life. Most <laughs> important being birth, second most important being death. And it's not even mentioned. <laughs> that inspired me, actually. And I thought, damn it, let me see if I can do, you know, I, I, I'm arrogant, I'll see if I can do something. And, uh, and what changed me, frankly, was first of all, two things. I read the literature on gerontology and um, uh, to begin with. And secondly, I realized that if you are to understand aging and mortality, you have to start understand what is the mechanism that keeps organisms alive because aging and mortality means that something's gone wrong with that. I mean, it's very simplistic thing. Something's gone wrong uh, in, in sustaining life. So what sustains life? Metabolism. So something screwy has been going, goes on with metabolism. So I started studying metabolism. And in doing so, I learned about all these fantastic scaling laws. And when I saw those scaling laws, I thought, gee whiz, this is fantastic. Why isn't this a central piece of biology? It's quantitative. It covers the complete scale of biology from mycoplasma up to an ecosystem. It covers you know, something like 27 orders of magnitude. You've got the same bloody scaling laws. And why isn't there something that biologists aren't going bonkers about? Well, I learned that biologists used to go bonkers about it um, up until the molecular revolution. Mm. And, uh, and that, of course, put the end to that because it was, you know, many of the great biologists thought about these things. I mean, Huxley and Darcy Thompson and JBS Haldane and so on. All these people were quite concerned about that. Uh, but of course, once the molecular revolution came, which was of course extraordinary, um, and, and the discovery of the structure of DNA and so on and so forth, it changed the whole picture. And it became like, in one sense, like, like high energy physics, that everything now was, you had to explain everything in terms of molecules and genes, period. And, and what was forgotten was of course the whole organism and ecosystems and so on in that picture. In the same way that when I was doing high energy physics, the, the culture was, and still to some extent is, that all you've got to understand are the fundamental laws, um, you know, quarks and gluons or now string theory. And from that, you can build up from quarks and gluons, you get uh, nucleons and then you get nucleus and then you get atoms and then you get molecules and then you get everything and then life and everything around us. And so, you know, all you got to do is get the fundamental laws and then you become an engineer and you turn the crank and out pops everything, which is ridiculous. It is. Um, uh, completely ridiculous. And it's even encapsulated in what my dear colleagues and friends call the theory of everything. Mm -hmm. so to say the theory of everything, which of course doesn't explain anything, <laughs> is, you know, I mean, it, it, it is ridiculous. So the thing that it can explain, which is absolutely fantastic, is the origin of the fundamental laws and the evolution of the universe. And that is fantastic. But, you know, the physical universe up through galaxies. But after that, you know, once you get the Earth and the and the, the big question, where in the hell does complexity come from? How in the hell does complexity come from these simple laws? The, I mean, the, 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 one of the great fantastic discoveries, I think, of the 20th century was that 
the universe is incredibly simple as the whole. I mean, you can write the equations. You can write the equations on a blackboard, and that tells you about the origin of the universe. I mean, actually, to solve them is very complicated and so on. But the actual equations are really simple. You can encapsulate you know, the history of the universe in an extraordinary condensed fashion. Um, and indeed, you know, the paradigm that in those equations lies life, including you and me talking, you and we talking, is totally ridiculous. Um, but, you know, that was sort of the idea. But so something new happened. So something called complexity, some, and then part of complexity being adaptability and evolvability and the whole kind of Darwinian view of evolution and the whole question of diversity. So um, anyway, this excited me doing this and the scaling laws were sort of the way a theoretical physicist could sort of latch on to something and start learning. And so I set myself, first of all, the question, where in the hell do these extraordinary scaling laws come from? The unit, I mean, not only are they scaling laws, they're simple, they're the simplest possible yeah. scaling law you could imagine. And we're talking about the most complicated system in the universe. <laughs> you know, and here's these very simple laws. Where in the hell do they come from? And how come they all have basically similar exponents? I mean, why? I mean, things that seem to have no relationship to each other scale in the same way. Why is this? And so that, and, and in particular, the problem I still am passionate about, and that is death. <laughs> what is, <laughs> calculating the, you know, why it is we live 100 years. And, and the last thing I want to say about that was I realized in formulating the question, where does a hundred years come from for the lifespan of a human being uh, in this like coarse-grained way of thinking? Yeah. And, and why is it only two to three years for a mouse? Yeah. Amazingly is a question that hadn't been asked as far as I can tell in biology, which is where do those numbers come from? It's not, of course, why do we age and why do we die has been addressed. But it does, even though it plays a very minor role in biology. Um, but where in the hell do the numbers come from? And that's a that's kind of a physicist's way of asking the question. By the way, death, of course, was a major part of the Darwinian, you know, Darwin's books. Of course, needless to say, he realized that death played a crucial role, clearly, in natural selection. It is also yeah. a really a really big part of your book too. I I, I was uh, intrigued in the particularly in the chapter about death uh, that it was a, a Bernard Herzog movie, the one that sent you in the in yes. the chase of the biggest uh, answers of of life. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, what is it about uh, about uh, death? Uh, what 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 answers can science give us that all those years of philosophy couldn't couldn't get? Well, you know, I still don't know how to answer that question, frankly. Um, I had become interested, you know, I came interested in death, um, partially because I came, I had a religious upbringing. So, and death plays a major role in religion, um, of course, I mean, in some form or another anyway, um, in all religions. And, um, And, and in particular, it plays a crucial role in, um, in almost all religions in saying that actually there isn't such a thing. I mean, it's an illusion. That in fact, there's this other piece of you that goes on, the soul or your karma or whatever, I don't know, whatever it is. Yeah, but we modern people cannot believe in that. Yeah, people <laughs> cannot face death. That's what I began to realize is that human beings, well, the first thing to recognize is that we are the only organism, I, I believe, that knows it's going to die. Mm -hmm. we, are, we know we have a finite lifetime. We know we have to face it. You know, your dog and cat don't know it basically till it happens. Ah, lucky them. I know it. <laughs> I'm, I'm over 80 and I'm going to die soon. And that's... You know, I have, I have to come to terms with that. 
but you know as a cult you know sort of as a global culture it seems that it's very difficult for us to face the fact that you know what's going on inside this brain of mine inside this head of mine and all these marvelous things and ideas and experiences and emotions are going to disappear and i no longer exist but everything else is going to go on that just seems unfair if nothing else <laughs> <laughs> you know um you know uh, it's terrible you know i have grandchildren and i'd love to see them when they're your age and so on and so forth you know it's and, and you start to ponder that and you realize shit wouldn't it be marvelous if there was some afterlife and so somehow that's my feeling as to how religion in some ways evolved so um uh and i don't you know i don't subscribe to that um i i i'm, I'm probably agnostic on it in a way i mean i i do consider myself spiritual because i in the in the sense that i the science just the magic of science whatever the science is the magic of explanation and the gee whiz or eureka moments that we have when we're either learning or doing research even in a small little way is is so extraordinary and it taps into something very deep for, for many of us and uh, and the person that by the way i was most influenced by you know it's very hard to read is uh, uh baruch spinoza the philosopher spinoza who sort of talk really talks in these terms i mean he understood that somehow um and uh, and he of course you know in a certain sense identifies god with the universe which is fine as far as i'm concerned that god i can appreciate i mean whatever whatever that means so but death plays a very singular special role um you know it's it's impossible for us to ask the question i mean we consider it an impossible question in science to ask the question where was i before i was born i mean you know that's sort of and so the the complementary question to that is where am i going when i'm dead <laughs> it's it's like and it's hard to sort of come to terms with the fact well i wasn't there i didn't there was nothing before i was born there's nothing after i'm dead dead so you know, now science i don't think can answer these you know i think this is you know I, i'm not sure science can play any significant role in answering that kind of question which is the role of religion i don't want to decry religion i mean i'm not trying to put religion down in any way um or thinking about that you know, fact, thinking about this i think is crucially important but somehow i'm not sure how science can play a role and so even though i'm intrigued by it and i'd love to be able to address those questions um my way of dealing with it was to try to understand what's limiting my lifespan in the first place and uh, try to understand a little bit about the processes that are leading to my aging and uh, an ultimate uh, death um, you know it's really interesting the way you put it about how all this marvelous inner uh, universe is going to end on death because There's this book by Soren Kierkegaard it's called The Denial of Death uh, and he says exactly like the same argument like uh, all all of this uh, seems like a farce to have blame yeah. and to be and to be conscious and 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 all of it is going to end and then he says how complex food for worms have god created uh, and, <laughs> and 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 it, it, it struck me the 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 coincidence of of complexity how complex food for worms if anything else we're complex uh, and that's why i wanted to ask you uh, some really simple question uh, nothing much what is <laughs> complexity <laughs> <laughs> very simple. only only soft balls here <laughs> uh, what is complexity well you know i, I had that quote in my book <laughs> yeah about you know uh, it's like pornography you know <laughs> I need but work when I see it. <laughs> complexity is like that. So you can of course describe complexity and and in a certain sense, you know, even though that's like a joke to say, you know, I know it when I see it. To some extent that's true. You know, we we um so the one way one thing I would put I would go back to what I was saying about the evolution of the universe and the laws of physics. 
I mean, physics is the science of simplicity, um, meaning that you can encapsulate extraordinarily complicated things in, in, you know, one or two equations. I mean, after all, the motion of the planets around the sun and the motion of any satellite, which is allowing us to have this conversation, you know, I can, to a pretty good approximation, write down two equations on a blackboard that explains all that, you know, Newton's laws of motion, Newton's law of gravitation. And that's it, you know, and that's kind of extraordinary. Not only that, as you well know, that explains much more than that, it explains every motion on this planet. So it's kind of remarkable, but it's simple in the sense that we can do that. Now, we can't imagine, at least I can't imagine, doing that for the way my brain works or for predicting, you know, the stock market tomorrow or, well, stock market tomorrow might be able to predict, maybe, but certainly not in a month's time or, and so on, or, you know, predict when a war will break out and so forth. So, and, and that's because um, these systems have, of course, first of all, they have enormous number of components, um, um, or, which are interacting often non-linearly. That's a cru crucial piece of it. And um, one of the things that comes from that inter those interactions is a sense of evolution, the sense that these systems, you know, one of the one of the things about complex systems and the ones that most of us are interested in are adaptive systems, complex adaptive systems, life, which adapts to external changes um, or even internal changes for that matter, but adaption, evolution, um, the so-called emergent behavior that laws emerge that, and that the, uh, the, the system is not just the sum of its parts. So cities, which I have, well, let's just talk about biology first. You are not just the sum of your 10 to the 14 cells. Obviously, you know, you're much more than that. Um, and the city is much more than the sum of all its citizens or all its roads and all its buildings and all its electrical lines. It's much more than all of that. And even if you put it all together and you wrote every single thing down, that would still not be the city. It's something more. And that is an emergent phenomenon. And that's why we have the word the city. And that's why we have you know, the, the, the concept of organism or even the concept of cell. After all, the cell is made up of many components and is a highly complex adaptive system. And so, you know, that's the only way I can. So I can't define it for you, to be honest. <laughs> I tried I, and I've given up like many others. And, and I, I'm quite satisfied with um, having this more qualitative, descriptive um, way of talking, which sort of boils down, I hate to say it, to, you know, we, we 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 recognize it when we see it, um, uh, and it does. But it does. It is. It, it brings up big issues which people have grappled with, which would be wonderful. Two two major ones which are interrelated. One is: could we imagine that there's a universal theory of complexity, that is the analog to thermodynamics, you know, that incorporates information theory as well as thermodynamics, which is energy. And, and, and that there's some universality in terms of the fundamental laws of complexity, so that um, a cell, um, a city, um, your consciousness, and so on, all somehow satisfy these laws, which can be put into some mathematical form. I don't believe that's possible, but some people do. Um, uh, but so there's that, and then associated with that, which which would be a subset of that is to have a measure of complexity which people have tried to do uh one famous one is you know you you can ask about a system what is the minimum algorithm i would write a program to produce this thing what is the minimum algorithm that can produce what this system does and and uh that you know use that as a measure of complexity uh it's it has some merits, but I have, a, I, of course, it's it's making everything algorithmic, and sort of like a computer, um, and we're going to see more of that, especially with the hype about AI and machine learning. 
I think those kinds of ideas will gain more attention, even though, and, and maybe, and that's good actually, I, I, even though I'm very skeptical, frankly, um, I, I think that's good, but it's more than, but it's more than that, actually. So I don't know, my, this is not a very satisfactory answer, okay. but it's just, uh, you know, it, it's, but it's grappling with those problems, that, that issue. But I think it should not stop one working on it. I think that's the bottom line. You know, one shouldn't stop. One shouldn't stop thinking about those questions and working on complex adaptive systems. Yeah, it seems to me in your book that you are like standing at the edge of a of a new science. Uh, uh, is that what uh, what uh, Stephen Hawking was talking about when he said that the science of the 21st century was going to be the science of complexity? I think so. Yes, I think he recognized. Which I mean, that's one. You know, the Santa Fe Institute was founded by a bunch of extraordinary uh, uh, scientists. You know, several Nobel Prize winners, a major Nobel Prize winners, um, who recognized that uh, two things really. One is that many of the issues, just the problems that we're beginning to face at the end of the 20th century. So this was they're talking in the 1980s, but some of the many problems that they foresaw like global sustainability and global warming, um, but also, you know, understanding economic systems in a more fundamental way and understanding, uh, you know, climate in a more fun, you know, those kinds of, these kinds of issues, which here to, until then was sort of, um, you know, was in this kind of physics framework that, well, those are just engineering problems. Just what I said earlier, you know, they just follow from the basic laws. So we're not interested in those. And to that enormous credit, they began to, what began to emerge was the idea that there are these emergent laws. That in fact, um, you know, it was Philip Anderson, um, yeah. the person that really stressed the importance that, look, it's sort of obvious in a way, you don't, I mean, let's take biology. You don't have to, you don't have to know anything about quarks and gluons or strings to talk about cells or to solve cancer, to understand, you know, it's, you know, it's, there's no relationship. They're, they're effectively disconnected. Um, even though it's another, it's, they're, they're connected conceptually, maybe, but they're not connected in terms of mechanism and dynamics. And I think that was crucial. I think people understood that before then, but no one acted on it. And I think Anderson was the first to truly articulate it explicitly. And that was, in fact, coming out of these conversations with these other people in founding the Santa Fe Institute in order to say, yes, um, we need to combine these two things. One is to recognize that these are fundamental science problems uh, of themselves. And secondly, there's a certain urgency to addressing them because of, um, of what's happening on the planet. I, I recently read uh, Phil Anderson's uh, biography. And yeah. you know, I've always been a big fan of More is Different. It's like a, <laughs> such a masterpiece. And we actually discussed it in this channel before because uh, Sean Carroll talks about yeah. it in his uh, in book, uh, The Big Picture. Um, I just find it funny that uh, Phil is, uh, according to what I read, you know, he was. Main, one of the main reasons why the, the collider was canceled. So yeah. somehow he took away that job for you from you and then you joined him in the dark side of complexity. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I have to admit that's true. Uh, Phil Anderson played a very bad role. I mean, he was a friend of mine in the end, but he played a very bad role in the SSC in the demise of the superconducting super collider. Um, and uh, Ironically, that more is different was inspired to, to some extent by uh, his, uh, you know, reaction to high energy physics in general, and inspired by the fact that, and, and rightly so, by the way, that look, don't go around saying we need to understand the fundamental laws in order to understand all this stuff on the planet. We don't need those, you know, we may want to understand those for their own sake and because of deep philosophical, spiritual reasons to understand the fundamental laws of nature, the origins of the universe, but that's not going to help us, you know, understand 
life and, uh, and so on. So More is Different is a wonderful essay and so on. But it is ironic that he was a founding, you know, that it ended up, he was a founding father, so to speak, of the Santa Fe Institute. And uh, when he founded the Santa Fe Institute with others, including Gil Mann, um, I was still heavily involved in high energy physics and was rather skeptical of what these guys were doing. I hate to admit that. I was very skeptical, even, even I would add sarcastic about it. <laughs> I, I was quite, uh, I, did, I wasn't convinced they were serious, frankly. I thought these were a bunch of old men uh, just looking for a nice place to go and retire, kind of thing. <laughs> Fair, wrong. So, but, um, but eventually I saw the light, so to speak. And uh, even though I love high energy physics and I'm still a great fan, and if I still had, if I still had the ability and time, I would still like to work on it. Um, these other questions, the questions I got involved in through what I talked about earlier, beginning with the scaling laws um, and trying to understand life and ultimately social life um, became so much more interesting actually and partly because you could make serious progress you know i mean i was working on string theory something called string field theory in fact when i was making this gradual shift and that is what that is incredibly technically so difficult um and you make epsilon progress <laughs> You know, after a year's work, and no one really recognizes it anyway. <laughs> you know? Whereas, you know, these questions in biology, not that, I mean, they're obviously just as challenging, but you, you know, you didn't have to have the same technical expertise or pyrotechnics to address the questions. Um, what you needed more, the way I used to say it is, in high energy physics, we know all the questions. To ask, they've all been. The que we don't know how to answer them, and they're extremely difficult. In biology, what I began to realize is, in some of the things I worked on, wasn't clear what the question was. What the hell is the question I want to answer? Actually, I mean, apart from the obvious one, what is life? Where did it come from? But you know, within a, you know, what is the question I really want to try to understand, and and how do I formulate that? Because it's all so nebulous and qualitative. How can I write an equation to say this? And that would take months. In fact, one of the, my most cited papers, um, I spent months trying to organize in my head. And once I did it, I wrote it down. And over the weekend, I solved it. And it became a much cited paper in nature. And so, <laughs> but it was completely, it was fairly easy to solve actually but it, and it was easy to write down but it took months to figure out ah that's the way you have to that's what you should be thinking of mm. you know and so and i find that's still true with biology of course i was new to biology and so i was struggling but but it was but one the great thing i shouldn't talk about i all the time i had two extraordinary collaborators well, one one in particular jim brown who is a, is a great biologist um just a marvelous thinker um and the other was his student who's now a very well-known ecologist Brian Enquist um and um uh, they were great it was a great collaboration and uh and and that's important if you do move into a different field and you do move even if it's associated a close field you you know it's very important to have someone who's an expert who is very open um to, to spending time back and forth explaining things and so on. And, and of course, you know, for a physicist doing mathematics, most of my, a lot of my time with them was not just learning, but was trying to explain mathematics in English to biologists <laughs> who heard, you know, I used to say to them, this is unfair, this is a joke. They, they knew how to add and subtract, and they probably could do multiplication, but long division was a real challenge. <laughs> 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 That's very unfair. I did. It was that was the feeling I had coming out of string field theory, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, of course, it wasn't that. That's a total exaggeration and unfair. But, 
But relatively speaking, it meant that I had to spend a lot of time trying to explain in incredibly simple terms, you know, complicated, but not, you know, for a, a good theoretical physicist, not a big challenge, some of those things. And likewise, they had to explain very sophisticated mechanisms and phenomena in biology uh, that, are, uh, un, that are known in great detail, but explain them in simple terms and say to me, look, you don't need to know about all that detail. That's, you know, that goes into the papers and actually it really doesn't matter. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter if you want the big picture, you know. And that was extremely helpful. And I've discovered there are few biologists that can do that, actually. They tend to get bogged down in telling you all the goddamn details, which eventually you might you need to know, but you don't need to know to actually try to understand something often. Because one of the other things I learned is if you understand too much and you understand what all these things that all these smart people have done before you, all you can think of is all the reasons why what you're thinking of won't work. Mm -hmm. Stops you doing it. So it's good to know enough that it's an interesting problem and the idea isn't entirely crazy uh, to go ahead. And then, you know, it's an iterative process. That's the way it's turned out for me. And that's true for the work I did on cities. That, that is a part I find intriguing in the, in, in the book uh, because it's not an obvious connection to make. Uh, how, how do you see that connection between the rules that govern the birth growth and death of of organisms and and cities yes so um two things one is um, when i was doing it first of all um you know you what, what, what you know the basic um uh, explanation that we developed for all these scaling laws was it was the mathematics and physics of networks. So it was all based on networks and networks sustain life and is the constraints of the underlying networks, whether it's as macroscopic as the cardiovascular system or microscopic as the flows of, of molecules or energy within a cell, within a mitochondria. Maybe. But these are all to think in terms of, in fact, what's behind Manuel, essentially, that picture <laughs> behind you, of course, is what it is. So it's the physics and mathematics. That was the idea. And that proved to be extremely fruitful and very powerful. Um, with, you know, you had to add some lots of various assumptions and hypotheses, and uh, in some cases, some bells and whistles. But, but once you have that picture, it's very hard not to immediately extrapolate. Actually, the first thing I extrapolated to, by the way, was not that, and I spent some time on rivers, river networks. And uh, I never published anything, which was a shame in the way, and I did some interesting, what I thought was interesting work, but I never completed it. But um, in so doing, it became also clear that maybe cities are like this. Or no, actually, cities and then companies might be in some way like this, you know, because, you know, organizational charts are often um, are networks and have a kind of fractal like um, structure. So I thought that was good. Now, so I always had that in the back of my mind, but then I was very fortunate. One of the great things about the Santa Fe Institute is that, that um, just to say a couple of words about it. Um, so it was founded by these marvelous men, these fine scientists, and they wanted to focus on complex adaptive systems. But implicit in that, and what became explicit, was that that meant necessarily it had to be transdisciplinary. And so the idea of the Institute was we bring everybody together. We bring anthropologists and economists and physicists and mathematicians and so on, computer scientists together who are interested in these things. And then, you know, that's who we need to sort of understand both conceptually and technically some of the big issues. 
Um, so while, when I was working, I wasn't yet at the Senef Institute, but I would be, I'd spend a lot of time there. But visiting there on sabbaticals were two people who were ma major parts of it. One was an economist, actually an ex-statistician who'd become an economist named David Lane. And the other was an anthropologist named Sander van der Leo, uh, both from Europe. And uh, they heard me lecture on the biology. And then they came to me one day and talking and said, you know, why don't you do all this for cities and companies? Or for cities, actually, they said first. And I said, well, yes, I've thought about that, but cities are so boring. <laughs> so I, think, I mean, yeah, we could do it. And they said, well, we'd like to, um, we're thinking of putting in a proposal to the European Union in Brussels, and maybe you'd like to be part of it. And I said, well, I want to work on companies because companies are much seem so much more interesting. But it turns out, by the way, I've now worked on both. Cities are much more interesting than companies. <laughs> and I did not realize that cities are, uh, are absolutely core and central. But anyway, um, so the you know it was sort of a natural evolution, but it was greatly enhanced and accelerated by the fact that I was at the Santa Fe Institute. In the, in, in the same way that the biology was with the interaction with, you know, real card carrying biologists. Here I was interacting now with social scientists um, who knew a little bit about cities and companies. And so um, even though I didn't collaborate, I, we, we, we formed, the, we were the co-PIs on a proposal and it got funded. Um, and I started a new collaboration based on that. Um, but we acted, the three of us acted sort of semi-independently. And I started my own collaboration with a new set of collaborators. Again, doing what, I didn't say this earlier, in biology, making it quite multidisciplinary, bringing together. Of course, the biology one was me at first and the biologist, and, but it did expand to include um, another mathematical physicist, and then a, um, an anthropologist, and so on. We expanded it some. And the one in, uh, that we started to, to work on cities had other physicists, um, uh, usually condensed matter physicists. Um, and um, it had an urban geographer, um, an urban economist, and another anthropologist and so on. So it was very eclectic, again, very broad. And uh, we started working on, uh, on, on that. But we're within the same paradigm saying that, look, well, there it was somewhat different. In the first, we had to establish the do city scale because I didn't say this. Uh, well, I did say this actually, yes. The biology, one of the things that made the biology work so well was that these scaling laws had already been discovered. I mean, we didn't discover them. We have discovered some of them since, new ones, but they all, you know, they had already been known for 70, 80 years. And many of them discovered in the 50s and 60s. And there were books written on them, books compiling them, actually, rather than uh, uh, explaining them. Uh, but in cities, there was almost nothing. There were a little bit of statistical stuff. People hadn't thought in these terms. So the first work we did was to ask the questions through city scale, and that opened up everything. When we saw the scaling, and we saw that, you know, um, uh, you know that um, Brazil, Chile, um, Spain, and Germany all scaled the city scaled in the same way. You think, shit, you know, this is amazing. You know, for different these and all all the metrics. It was like biology. All the metrics scaled in the same way. Same exponent. You know, what the hell is, you know, this is extraordinary. There obviously has to be an underlying fundamental theory. And it must be based, that was the idea, must be based in the networks. And the, the new thing there was, well, the networks, the first one thought of, well, of course, all the roads, electrical lines, and so they're obviously networks. But then a, a revelation came that, gosh, of course, the other part of a city that has no analog in biology is social networks. Mm -hmm. You know, what we're doing now, we're talking to one another and uh, information exchange in social networks. 
And uh, that was very important. And it was it's extremely interesting because um, I didn't say this, we didn't talk about any of the technicalities or anything, but the scaling laws in biology are almost universally sublinear, um, meaning that um, they're simple power laws, Y equals AX to the B, um, and that exponent B is, um, is always less than one in biology, and it's always a multiple of one quarter. And the network theory explained all of that. And uh, the less than one means that it's less than linear. If B was, if that exponent were one, it would be linear. So if you double the size, you would get double whatever it is. You need double the amount of metabolic energy. But in fact, you don't, you only need 75%. So that's the three quarters, that's the quarter. And this quarter plays this dominant role. So it's quite universal and quite extraordinary. Um, and I, in my naivete, assumed that cities, when we started looking at the data, cities would be boring and they would just sort of look like biology. They, may, they wouldn't be one quarter, they'd be different, maybe, because maybe the dynamics is a little different, but most importantly, um, uh, you know, they're, they are more, they're, they're more two-dimensional than life is. I mean, so that will play a role. So you expect a different exponent, but they're all going to be sublinear in the same way. And then Jesus Christ, at uh, one of the early workshops, a young postdoc working with us said, started presenting data. And they said, I got this interesting thing on restaurants in the Netherlands. And he showed it. And the bloody thing was super linear, meaning that instead of being less than one, it was bigger than one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then he showed some other things, and someone else showed one on patents. He said, yeah, well, I got data that I've been looking at as a little bit. And I said, look, guys, you've screwed up. You know, it, it, that can't be true. Um, you know, I think you got the, the, the data, you screwed up with the data, or you've done some analysis wrong. And I sat there, and I was quite adamant about it. And I sat there, and a half hour later, I said, fuck it, I've made a terrible mistake. That's fantastic, it's right. <laughs> of course it's right, it has to be because it's social networks and they're feeding back on each other. It's very different than biology. We're that, like we're, you know, you have conversations, you build on each other. So instead of getting less per capita, the bigger you are, you get more per capita. And that's what we're seeing in social interactions. Restaurants are places of social interactions creating patents, ideas, social interaction. And that was sort of the beginning of, and, uh, and that was fantastic. And again, we saw this universality. That's, so it's, it's been quite exciting. And uh, the only uh, regret I have is that I have, I, we have even though we have, we, we have a, a very well-developed, um, extremely well-developed, I think, a theory for the biological scaling of biology um, and extended it to growth and cancer, the structure of tumors, uh, understanding sleep, uh, why we sleep, you know, sleeping eight hours a night, and why an elephant only sleeps three, and a whale, uh, and a whale two, and a mouse 16. Understanding that, understanding even that aging problem that started me out, we under, I think I. We understand, and so on. So it's had a, it's it's got lots of tentacles. I'm disappointed that we don't have quite the same analogous theory for the cities, and the reason for that is that it's two networks that have to be integrated, and that's much harder. There's the infrastructural network, which looks like biology and has these sublinear economies of scale. The bigger you are. You need less roads per capita, less gas stations per capita. But that has to be completely integrated with the social networks. That is, uh, you know, the interaction which gets more per capita. And, you know, we, you're tied to them. Oh, you know, you are tied to your social network, to your family, your friends, your school, your teachers. That ties you. But at exactly the same time, you're tied to the ground. 
you're tied to the roads and the transport and your house and you have to take kids to school and you have to get to your office. So there, and you have to put that into mathematics and that's, we've done, it's very hard. Let's put it that way. And it's still been done, but it's not been done as satisfactorily. I must uh, and that interrelationship between the social networks and the infrastructure networks of the city kind of like ignites a, a chicken and an egg question, doesn't it? Like what what came first? Like because yes. like there where we have like the better infrastructure, we will have more social connections. But also our social connections, the ones that shape the infrastructure. So 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 what is happening there? Yes, no, you said it exactly. Uh, I, I would say it's sort of like it's like co-evolution. They co-evolved. Uh, they build on each other, and that also makes it very hard. You know, they they feed each other. You know, um, um, and, and the way the social networks evolve therefore changes the city. You know, the structure of the city. And I have speculated. I mean, I've, this is a wild speculation that the, the best. yeah, the structure <laughs> of the city is actually is first of all, it's clearly a reflection to some extent of the structure of our social interactions. But our social interactions are a result of obviously are constrained. Let's put it that way by the structure of our brains, by the neural pathways that have evolved and are now to some extent encoded in our DNA uh, that in, so that we can interact. And indeed, just a side comment, the universality that was astonishing about the um, urban the city scaling, that is, just to make clear what I mean by that, that the scaling of cities within Argentina is the same as the scaling of cities within the United States as it is in Portugal or Germany. It's the same. And it's the same for all these metrics. So um, even though so that it transcends history, geography, and culture, which is a reflection in this picture, that actually at this coarse grain level, social networks are the same wherever you are, because we're the same human beings. There's, you know, we may look different. We may, you know, have different color skins and different color hair and eyes, and some are taller and shorter, but basically, you know. It's a marvelous manifestation of the universality of men and women, which is wonderful. Um, so I, I, I like that very much. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to, again, put that into a sort of equations, it's very hard, but it goes back to the reason. So our brains, so in the end, the structure of the city, let me say it again, structure of the city is related to our social networks, the structure of us and dynamics of our social networks, but that is a reflection of the structure of our brains. Therefore, <laughs> the structure of Mexico City, which you've been struggling with, yeah. <laughs> is actually a representation of our brains. Yeah. Indeed, indeed, one last comment, when you think about brains, one of the things about brains, you know, it's again one of these things, if you read about you know, neuroscience, of course, it's all about axons and neurons and Purkinje cells and so on. But you know, none and all these marvelous networks, which is a network, but uh, neural networks, but you forget that the whole bloody thing is supported by this other network, which is the blood. The blood has to supply the oxygen and the, and none of that that's what you're seeing at exactly what you're <laughs> behind Manuel. And, uh, and so in that sense, the brain is remarkably like the city because it has to integrate those two. And so I remain somewhat cynical and skeptical about a lot of the work that's done on trying to have the bigger picture of the brain, understanding the brain that doesn't take into account that it is constrained by the structure of the cardiovascular system and the fact that you have to get oxygen to each of those through those capillaries to the cells and then to the neurons and support all that marvelous stuff that's going on inside our heads and so it's like the city but it's the same as the city the city is like just like that nice i think uh just to give a chance i think daniela wanted to ask something yeah, I was just going to say that now that you're making the comparison between a city and the brain, 
I find it really intriguing because it seems to suggest that even though there are different languages to talk about different levels of reality, and maybe if you're talking about uh, particle physics, it wouldn't make sense for understanding higher scale organisms or something like that. It's curious how we have these fractals where you, you can have the networks of the cardiovascular system looking just like leaves and then maybe that looks like a river. And so it seems to suggest that these scaling laws could apply or could kind of bridge between these different languages. Yeah. And another thing that's interesting in your book is that you said like, we have scaling, for instance, between cities in the same country, but then we cannot compare them to cities in a different country because it's like they're completely different worlds and they follow different rules. So how do you reconcile those two? Is can we really talk about scale bridging those yeah. or are we still inside limited languages on like kind of limited planets of yeah, ways very good. Kind of things? Yeah, very good question, of course. But wonderful things I've struggled with. But, but part of the reason I wrote that book the way I did was of course to show the universality of scale, but in particular of fractal-like scaling, that this, this self-similarity permeates sort of all levels of living systems, and of course, even non-living ones, but particularly living systems um, from the macroscopic down to the uh, intracellular microscopic. And that's kind of extraordinary. And one of the reasons for that, I believe, I, I forget if I talked about this in the book, actually, is that in a way, fractals um, are very often are a manifestation of a certain of optimization, of uh, the optimization of transport and distributing systems and getting from A to B in the shortest possible time. And um, it's hard to make that, it's hard to prove that as a general statement, frankly, but in many systems, almost all systems one looks at, that it happens to be that is the case. So I've speculated that, um, that is the, the underlying principle is to do with some kind of optimization. And someone smarter than I will, will eventually, I believe, prove that, that there is some, something else underlying all this to do with optimization of complex systems. This goes back, by the way, to your, the question about you know, um, defining complexity and a theory of complexity. I think that will be a central element of complexity is trying to terms like that yes yeah, sort of optimization and and the role of fractal or i like to use the word fractal like behavior because often you know the the circulatory system one of the things in our original paper is uh, we solved for the this idealized uh, cardiovascular system and uh, showed that um you know people said it's a fractal actually it isn't a fractal the mathematics it's a continuously changing fractal actually um, so it's fractal-like is what I like to use to sort of slightly distinguish it. That's a mind, it's a technical point. But anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so um, I, I do believe there are the, the there is some sort of underlying universal principle that's to do with that that get, then gets expressed in these remarkably simple scaling laws. Um, now the sec your so kind of the second part of your question is one that we've, not, we've spent very little time on, to be honest. And that is this question of comparing urban systems. That is, just to make it clear what we're talking about, and I think this was your question. So, you know, um, the scaling of crime in the United States and in Japan is the same. That is, they scale in the same way and they scale super linearly. That is, the bigger the city, um, the more crime you have per capita to the same degree. You know, if you double the size of a city, roughly on the average, you get uh, 15, you get more than twice the amount of crime. You get 15% more. So you get more crime because there's more social interaction, is the statement, is the underlying idea. Um, uh, but of course, the overall scale of crime in Japan is much lower than the overall scale, than the scale of crime in the United States. The number of murders in Tokyo 
is probably this, probably 10 a year. I mean, I don't know this, I've forgotten. But that, that, you know, but it's several thousand in New York City. And so, uh, you know, the overall scale is different. And that is a manifestation of, that is a manifestation of history and culture. And one of the questions, you know, where, can you come to terms with that in some way? I don't know the answer to that. It's outside of this framework. We have, you know, a little bit, and other people have done it, I've been skeptical about it, about um, looking at these various metrics, um, not uh, in terms of cities, but in terms of countries. Um, obvious thing to try to do as the next level of organization. Um, I'm skeptical because countries, by and large, um, are sort of political beings. I mean, they're not, they're not sort of organic like a city is, um, or, or an organism for that matter, obviously. They, um, you know, often they're, they're formed because of certain geographical limits or wars that have been fought that set bound, artificial boundaries and so on. Um, so I was always a bit skeptical. Now there are people have looked at that and there are regularities. And, and I, I've often thought, especially more recently, that uh, we should go back and look seriously at that, uh, more seriously. And part of it is to answer your very question. Can, can we, by looking at that and thinking deep, more deeply about it, um, can we sort of get an inkling as to what it is that determines overall scale? Uh, it's the same question, by the way, um, if you look at metabolic rate of organisms, mammals scale in the same way as birds with this three quarters scaling law. Um, but birds on the average have a higher metabolic, you know, the overall scale, the curves are displaced relative or the lines, mm. the logarithmic plug are displaced relative to one another. Birds are, um, gener are generally higher by a factor. Doesn't matter what size it is, it's roughly the same factor. And that you might, you know, you I, I've got not looked at this. This is just my assumption and speculation. The reason for that is flying is is a lot of work. It's pretty <laughs> expensive, yeah. Metabolism, you know, in general, you know, it's you know, birds, uh, you know, walking is not as metabolically um, challenging as flying. There's no question. And, and people have examined some of that, but we have not done it. Uh, we've not looked at that as a research project. Um, it's been there. We talked about it many times, but no, we've not turned to it. By the way, one of the, just this is a side comment, um, your, your graduate student, so this is relevant in a way. Um, um, I, I run a very small group and my collaborations are very small on the scale of most collaborations these days. Um, you know, I, I would be, if I was still in the university, if I were in the university, I would never call myself the West Lamb because it connotes, <laughs> you know, there's all these people working with me, whereas there's in fact two. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, because I like that, I got old and I got, you know, I didn't want to run it. I ran a sizable high energy physics group, but I was, and then I was ran the Center for Institute but I didn't really want to run a big group again. Now, the reason I say that is only relevant to questions like this, because there's so many interesting, fascinating, challenging and difficult and important questions about some of this work. And, um, you know, we just have to choose uh, and you choose that intuitively, you know, um, you know, as to what to work on and, uh, you know, new data and something may come up and you say, oh, shit, we should really look at that. That's interesting. But it all is very serendipitous, frankly. Um, whereas if it were a group of, you know, six or a dozen or 20 people, postdoc students and others, um, we a lot of these questions we would have been addressing. Um, and, and in fact, just the, the, one of the things, <laughs> this is a very strange thing to say, but I've enjoyed this work immensely. And one of the reasons I enjoyed it so much early on was that no one else was doing it kind of thing. You know, I could go at my own pace. 
I could watch football when I wanted to. <laughs> Crappy 1947 film if I wanted to. It didn't kill me. <laughs> and then suddenly, you know, there's all this stuff going on and I don't like the fact that I have to do, there's all the, and these are more and more interesting questions, of course. I mean, when we started, there were, when I started, there was just sort of one or two questions. Now there's a hundred. Yeah. That's the nature of the beast, and that's great. I mean, I don't want to, I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, that's how it should be, and so on. Except when you're over 80 years old. <laughs> you know, you want to be able to go watch football and not feel guilty. <laughs> I, I wanted to, and by the way, that's the reason. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that everyone in the audience uh, follows the idea of what is it like, what is a fractal? Because I think there's a lot of misconceptions and, you know, mystical thing. And it's like right. this. Uh, so, so could you give us an intuitive definition of what it's fractal and why this net, sorry, why, why this scaling loss look fractal like? Yes. Yeah, so, um, and I have an apology to make here or something because I wasn't because I don't know the audience and what level. No, that's fine. Yeah. I'm not sure, you know, whether some technical terms are understood and not. So I've, as I've talked, I've just sort of gone through and uh, I'm glad. Those smart this. guys, they, they know how to Google. Exactly. Google, Google can tell them. So don't worry about it. <laughs> great thing. That's one of the great things with this this uh, sisters uh, having uh, the internet. So um, a fractal, first of all, you know, just uh, just to look at it, we all recognize a fractal. It's like complexity, we all recognize <laughs> We see it because it's just a branching tree, a tr literally a tree, a tree, a tree that you see outside is a fractal. Uh, classic, yeah, he's got pictures. And, and the great, the thing about oh, your, your circulatory system, you have an aorta, and it breaks into two other arteries, and they break into uh, more vessels, and then more vessels, and then it just keeps breaking, keeps branching down further and further. Um, so that's a classic fractal network. Um, but the, 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 the major characteristic is that it repeats itself, so that if you were to take literally a tree, for example, a literal tree, um, and you were to cut, and you, you've done this in your head, I'm sure, even if you haven't done it physically, and you cut one a branch of it, and you take it away, it looks just like a tree. And in fact, it is. It's the same, it's just a scaled down version of the original tree. And you can take a piece of that little smaller tree and cut a piece of that out and take it away, and it's a scaled down version of that. And they scale, and they scale in a regular fashion. And that's the important point, in a very regular fashion, and obeying very simple mathematical rules. And, um, and so you repeat. So the thing that's behind Manuel is another kind of fractal, where the rule says, whatever you do, whatever you did before, just do it again on a smaller scale, basically. And it produces sort of weird, interesting patterns like that. They just sort of repeat themselves, but getting smaller and smaller. And the classic one that is used to always be shown is broccoli, the famous broccoli. You see, a, you take a piece of broccoli, and you know it's the same thing as I said about trees. You break off a little piece of the broccoli, the piece that you're going to eat. And if you look at it, it looks just like a little broccoli. And in fact, one of the things you can do, if you're not familiar with this, that is fun to do, and you can do it now with your iPhone or your whatever you're smartphone is, you take a picture of that little piece of broccoli, and you take a picture of the big piece of broccoli, and then you put them next to one another at the same scale, and they look the same, basically. You can't tell one, you could not tell which is the small piece and which was the big piece. Or you take the Grand Canyon, well, or some version of it in wherever you are, you take a Grand Canyon, and uh, there it is, but if you took a picture of it, above and you can do this actually and you scale it down actually if you show someone it they can't tell whether it's um the grand canyon or some something um you know in a little arroyo that's uh outside in the country um so it's uh it, it's it's that and that's why sometimes it's called scale invariant 
because until you put some, you take some external measure, you can't tell what scale it is. And what is remarkable about Daniela's question is that as, you know, at a very coarse grained level, very low resolution level, everything around you sort of is like a fractal. That's what's amazing. And this, this curious man, Mandel ben, uh, Benoit Mandelbrot was the man that sort of realized that. Um, uh, and uh, in his lovely book, the, the only trouble with Mandelbrot, I'll just say, even though it's sad that he's dead, uh, is that uh, he didn't, he didn't, he wasn't interested in explaining any of it. He just wanted to show pictures of it and put <laughs> mathematic scaling, but he didn't try to explain it. And I had many frustrating arguments with it that I thought it was empty without explanation. It just becomes gee whiz. It is gee whiz and it's exciting <laughs> gee whiz. But, you know, we're scientists. We want to understand why. And that goes to the question earlier. And the reason for many of these things is because if you want to optimize the system, if you want to, for example, now going to the question that you raised, Manuel, for example, about your circulatory system, if you analyze that mathematically, if you just take a bunch of tubes that are joined, just keep joining and branching, but with any, no scaling, you just let them branch and any, do whatever they like. But as long as they keep branching, and then you put a pump at the top of them, a heart that goes boom, 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 and you pump fluid, blood through it, to reach the capillaries. And then you make the following assumption. Evolution has made the, um, the, heart, the, the system, let me repeat this, the system that has evolved through competition among species, the system that is evolved is the one where the heart does minimum amount of work mm. in order to pump blood through that network in order to feed the cells. If you do that, amazingly, that system has to be this fractal-like behavior. Okay, that's the, that's the result. And that was the result of the original work. And not only that, so you can um, calculate, you can derive formulas, for example, from that, if you wanted to know, um, let's see, if you wanted to know what the blood flow rate was, the velocity of blood, the stress on the walls of the ninth branch of a hippopotamus's cardiovascular system, there is a formula <laughs> by notes that will tell you what it is. And if you put in the number, uh, you will get basically the right answer. Now, it's a joke because no one, as far as I know, has ever measured <laughs> that. <laughs> but they have measured it for human beings and mice and rats and dogs. And it's correct. So, you know, and that comes from this optimization. Like, other things, but that's the main one. And that optimization um, can be put in a slightly different, uh, in, in, in a certain perspective by saying the, the reason you want to minimize the amount of energy that you devote to pumping blood through your circulatory system is in order to maximize the amount of energy that you can devote to sex and reproduction and the rearing of offspring, which mm -hmm the Darwinian fitness, I mean, the fitness metric for Darwinian evolution. So you want to maximize your, by maximize fitness by minimizing the mundane process of staying alive. I mean, the, 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 and so from that viewpoint, it's sort of a Darwinian viewpoint, the whole, the whole point of being alive is to have babies that so that your genes can progress and <laughs> do the things they do. It's a rather stark view of life. <laughs> but, uh, that is what life is. And, and one of the great, by, so that's just a point of departure for saying one of the great things that human beings have done is we've departed from that. 
we've realized, mm -hmm. you know, that it's more than that somehow. Yeah, the you meaning know, of life wasn't enough birth. for us. <laughs> <laughs> the meaning of life wasn't enough for us. <laughs> speaking of, um, sorry, uh, speaking of um, optimization of networks, have you seen this experiment where they put uh, a fungi over the map of the Tokyo uh, subway system yeah. and some uh, food on the on the Tokyo stations, and then the fungi kind of like replicates the 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 structure of the subway system isn't it doing like the same aren't like the the cells of the fungi kind of like solving the tr the traveling salesman problem just by optimizing its its network yes, I, uh, um, well I, i i know the work you're talking about um, although i never studied it in detail but i read the papers and so on and and i just saw that as um verification of this idea. Uh, I never sat down, maybe one should, someone should maybe see if, you know, you could derive that, you know, I mean, that is, you know, is it, you know, could you, I don't know how the subway system works in Tokyo, but it probably is like the roads. It, it opt in some sense optimizes. Um, and uh, so I saw that as, um, you know, just support conceptually for this idea exactly that and it's a very good one that uh, um, these systems move towards optimization now there's a lot of variance of course because by the way we should that's extremely important of course i mean absolutely fundamental that um of course there's variance everybody varies a little bit from uh, first of all um you know <laughs> the environmental niches in which you evolve clearly lead to all kinds of various deviations um, you know elephants have uh, long noses and giraffes have long necks and all the rest of that stuff I mean, everything and each does various different things so any metric that you move you measure even though it has very good scaling laws and they obey pretty well very well in fact every every animal deviates a little bit from it and it's that variation which is of course in a certain sense, the residue of Darwinian evolution. And, and of course, the other thing that goes to that is that if you look at city scaling law, they scale very well, but there's much more variance. And you can sort of understand that because, you know, organisms took a minimum of hundreds of thousands, in many cases, hundreds of millions of years to evolve for this kind of feedback mechanism inherent in natural selection to evolve and driving you towards a more, let's call it optimal solution. Uh, but cities have only been around hundreds of years, and in some cases thousands, but most cities have only been around hundreds of years and are still, of course, in the process of evolving. Um, uh, and by the way, we've done, we haven't talked about this at all, but we've done uh, more recently quite a lot of work. I did talk about it in the book, but we've done a lot of work recently um, which has been really nice actually i've enjoyed it a lot on companies and um, the scaling laws for companies have much more variance uh, but they do scale companies scale um, in, uh, in their own unique way but they scale following the same kind of scaling laws mathematically and um but there's much greater variance because most companies have only been around tens of years you know i mean mm -hmm. a few companies have been around hundred or two hundred years, but most have been around tens of years and then they die. Most of them disappear. So they don't really have time even to equilibrate or to move towards optimization. What um, is the difference there? Why is it so easy to kill a company or an individual, yeah. but not a city? Yeah. So that's the question that got me into some of the work, got me excited thinking about cities and companies actually, because one of the things I realized was another one of these questions that I was surprised. It was like a question about why is it a hundred years for our lifespan uh, that I, I suddenly I discovered that people hadn't asked, ironically. I mean, it's sort of obvious, um, you know, to put a hundred in there, not just about why we died. Um, in the same way about cities, because in this case, I mean, this is a statement, a testament To the fact that um, uh, of, of 
breaking things down to disciplines. The people who work on cities do not work on companies and vice versa, basically. Mm -hmm. So the question, the curious question, or the curious answer maybe, why is it that cities seem to go on forever? I mean, obviously not for, we don't know, but they, they keep growing and almost no cities die. Um, of course, you can think of cities that have died uh, and civilizations that have, but most cities go on living. Um, and in fact, the classic example I give is that you can drop atom bombs on cities and 25 years later, they seem to be doing fine, which is extraordinary. <laughs> um, whereas companies are incredibly fragile. So cities are extraordinarily robust and keep growing. Companies are extraordinarily fragile and stop growing. And cities don't seem to die naturally, whereas companies seem to disappear very easily. And in fact, one of uh, some analysis we did on all US publicly traded companies um, since 1950 showed that the um, half-life of a US company, publicly traded one on the stock exchange, is about 10 years. So it's very short. Um, so a company that's been around 20 years is already doing much better than the cohort of companies that started when it did. So that's pretty amazing that it's that short. Um, whereas cities, as I say, can continue. So why is that indeed? So this goes to the very heart, even though they're both social networks, they both um, have infrastructure, they both uh, function because of interaction between human beings, and they both function because of innovation and ideas and so on. So the fundamental difference is that um, companies, because of their very nature, have to be kind of top down traditionally, and almost, almost all of them a top down with a CEO and president, and then a hierarchy, and it's very structured. Cities, of course, have mayors and administrations, but they just make sure the city, if they're any good, they make sure the city at least functions, but they don't tell you what to do. That you don't, you can do what you like in a certain sense. And indeed, um, one of the things about companies uh, in terms of their life history, is that when they begin, when a company begins by a few people, you know, this, the, the six of us here might have an idea and say, shit, you know, we could make this thing and we're all going to become rich. Let's try to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, no, we could do that, but we could also do this. We, do, we have all these ideas, we get together full of ideas and excitement, and we start putting together a little company and we produce something or we do some some service we provide mm -hmm. or some product. Um, and uh, but it's more than that, we usually produce several lots of things. And then gradually, very quickly, you discover, um, you know, one or two of them do extremely well, they catch on, and the company starts to grow quickly. But these other six or seven, uh, not so they don't do so well, mm -hmm. even though they're actually the most interesting and exciting, but uh, they're not selling. So you have to adjust very quickly to the market and you keep growing because you're successful. But um, as something else happens, when you're small, you hardly need any bureaucracy. I mean, you do, obviously you do you have some, but once you get to a certain size, you have to realize you've got to get serious about bureaucracy. You have to have an administration, you have to pay your taxes, you have to pay all the laws and all the uh, constraints that uh, the, the government puts on you. You have to make sure that the floors are swept and the offices are kept clean. You have all of this stuff. Gradually, you have to build a bureaucracy and so on. And what generally happens is that bureaucracy grows bigger and bigger you have more and more laws you have to obey. And um, meanwhile, the market is, deter is making you go from being multi-dimensionality, thinking of many things, heading towards unidimensionality or small dimensionality. So you contract, even though you're growing, in terms of this 
product space and idea space, you are sort of being pushed towards uh, smaller, something smaller and smaller. And at the same time, you're getting hindered by more and more bureaucracy. And that typically means that when the external markets change significantly, you can't move with it because whilst you have grown from about 10 people to 100,000, meanwhile, there are other 10 people units and 10 people little companies that have even better ideas that can move much faster than you and produce them. And soon, bonk, you die. And that's typically what's happened. Now, what happens in cities? Cities go from being less smaller dimensionality to bigger and bigger dimensionality. Cities get more and more diverse the bigger they are uh, in terms of jobs and employment and so on. Um, and businesses, different types of businesses. New York is the most diverse city in the world in terms of the different kinds of businesses. If you look at the, there are these analyses that uh, governments do of the different types of business, they break them down into categories. It's like species, it's like in biology, species. And, and it's like, uh, I don't know, the middle of the Amazon, New York. It's got so many, it's unbelievable the number of species. You can, you know, there are stores you know, there's a store in New York, I don't know if it survived COVID, that sells only chess pieces, not chess sets. You can buy pieces. <laughs> no store in the world. I'm sure there's no store anywhere else in the world that does that, you know, that kind of thing. Or there's another store, maybe there's another one like this somewhere, that sells only antique fireplaces, not fire, antique ones. You know, this is pretty amazing. So this diversity, and this is part of this opening up of ideas. And this goes along also with tolerance because it, a great city encourages diversity in all respects and it's tolerant of crazy people. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you know what I mean, I use that in a loose <laughs> way. But you know, even crazy people walking the streets and talking to themselves or singing, that supply that pushes the boundary for the rest of us so the rest of us can sort of think of crazy you know you can sort of imagine doing something a little bit different maybe. <laughs> you know you might gee whiz maybe i could produce that play or maybe i could change my job and do something i don't know it, it provides a background culture that somehow encourages more and um, that's what you see. And the data, we've done analyses of that actually, and you see, and you can even have amazing, once again, systematic laws that they that they are obeyed actually. And so that leads to open-ended, kind of open-ended growth. Mm -hmm. And this lack of control, great cities facilitate rather than dictate, whereas companies tend to dictate and rarely facilitate, and they certainly do not tolerate crazy people. So much so that most big companies, in fact, if you look at the data, if you plot um, uh, the uh, R&D, research and development allocation of companies versus their size, you see that as a percentage of their size, say their assets or their sales, it gets systematically following these simple scaling laws, smaller and smaller. Oh. And if you just extrapolate, it eventually goes to zero. And indeed, many of the big companies, after all, think about this, when companies go through obviously cycles, when they're threatened and so on, what do they do when they're under stress? They say, ah, well, look, we don't need all that research and development. I mean, it's great when things are good, but now let's put it aside because when things get better, we'll, we'll build it up again. Yeah. One of the things that people do not, not recognize, it's pathetic actually, is that it's very easy to kill good ideas and good research 
and very hard to build it up. Yeah, that's why we'll never have another Bell Labs, I guess. Another what? <laughs> Bell Labs? Yes, exactly. Bell Labs is the classic example. And you know, they've sort of tried at times. I know uh, I've, I've visited there since in recent years, and they talk, trying to do something. They know they'll never do it, but they try to do something, and it's not even, it's a pale, it's not even a pale image. Yeah. It's so, so for really different, and it took years to build that up. Yeah. You, quickly, just quickly for the people listening to us and that don't know what Bell Labs was. Uh, Bell Labs was this uh, research lab that uh, uh, AT&T had as a, uh, when AT&T was an authorized mono monopoly in the uh, to the government, they funded this research lab that basically, in my view, invented the modern world. Like information <laughs> theory came out of there, satellites, lasers. I mean, the transistor. Just with that, everything that allows this communication right now was thanks to the existence of yeah. Bell Labs. And uh, once the, they break up the monopoly, they took uh, Bell Labs with them and... We haven't been able to replicate such a creative oh, place ever since. Exactly. No, it was an extraordinary institution and uh, it was a great tragedy to break it up. So it's one of those, it's a very interesting uh, set of uh, um, uh, uh, things that happen that, um, you know, something that, you know, there's sort of a funny lesson. I don't know what the lesson is exactly. <laughs> well, I do. And I will say that you know, something that was considered bad, a monopoly. So at and that's what Manuel said, a t monopolized the phone system in the United States, was the phone system of the United States. And it was a monopoly. And um, the United States has been since uh, uh, the um, turn of the, into the 20th century, from about, before the First World War, has been uh, very sensitive to monopolies that uh, the, the, the trying to promote capitalism, so to speak, you need to make sure that there are enough players in the game. Otherwise, you if you only have a monopoly, there's no longer competition, so to speak. So the idea was they should break it up and they should break it up into these mini companies and make them local. And that's what happened. I don't know. So they sort of deconstructed it into, you know, I don't know how many it was, little companies which might have been good. But of course, two things. So that was, uh, you know, it was well-intentioned, but it had two very bad consequences. The one that most people felt was that their service wasn't any longer as good. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> the small company couldn't provide the same service as the mm -hmm. big company that it had been part of. The thing mm -hmm. that most people, except those in science, did not appreciate was an even greater tragedy that Manuel just pointed out was that they no longer could the lab, so-called Bell Labs, be supported. And that was a terrible tragedy because it was a great, great physics department in a certain sense uh, in, in condensed matter physics and tremendous things came out of it. So the, the lesson there is intimately to do with complex adaptive systems that, you know, when they broke up in the monopoly, they were thinking in only one dimension, all the politicians and the others that were out to get them, one dimension. Capitalism needs competition. And in the, in the telephone communication industry, there's only one player. We need to have lots more players. So break it up and everything's going to get better because capitalism and entrepreneurship and competition ensures the best. That's sort of the paradigm. Well, of course, the thing about a complex system that we've learned is that everything is connected with everything else. And there's all kinds of unintended consequences that follow. And if you do not think systemically in a bigger picture and recognize that a priori at the beginning of the process, you are bound to have bad effects. And, uh, unintended consequences. So that uh, one, maybe some smart person in 1960, when this was being contemplated, could have predicted that yes, you might produce more competition and in many ways in the end it did actually. But um, 
you're going to suffer two major things. You're going to suffer this, uh, you're going to get poor service, which people may or may not care about, but you're also going to lose one of the great treasures of the United States that has made us, uh, you know, a powerful nation in terms of the leading stuff in the, uh, the modern world in terms of communications. As Manuel said, the laser, my God, uh, came out of that. And uh, by the way, I'm going to tell you an anecdote. I'm very nonlinear in my thinking. I have, to, <laughs> I have to tell you a story about that that I personally was involved in, a little teeny weeny one. So the laser had been invented by uh, Charles Towns, Charlie Towns, and Arthur Shallow at Bell Labs, as you said, you said. They got the Nobel Prize eventually for it. And by the way, they were brothers-in-law, just as a side comment. Mm -hmm. And because Bell Labs broke up, Towns left Bell Labs and became a professor at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And exactly, at exactly the same time that I became a graduate student at Stanford. <laughs> and at the end of my first year, when you're supposed to sort of start thinking about research, a uh, research advisor and so on, I knew that I had to be, I wanted to be a theorist, theoretical physicist. Um, and I knew that I was a complete disaster at experimental physics. Uh, I'd been done poorly in my class for mental physics. I, I was terrible. Um, but, I felt, but I felt very strongly that this, despite my feelings about theoretical physics, physics is fundamentally an experimental science. It's based on data, it's based on experiment, and I need to, I'd like to get a hands on. So I went to Art Shallow, and I said, yes, I'd like to become your student. He already had hired two, I was his third student. And, um, he said, sure. And so I worked with him for a bit. And he had the biggest laser in the world at that moment was at Stanford, which is tiny on the scale today, but it was <laughs> thing. And he was very excited. And he would like to do demonstrations of taking a laser beam at a piece of wood and, you know, drill a hole through the piece of wood to show how powerful it was, which is now pathetic. I mean, it's, I mean, but then it was great, and it was great to see. You see this little hole go through. And he said, you know, this laser, we're going to make them much more powerful, and it's going to revolutionize the planet. And I said, really? That? That's good. He said, yes, because... You, because with this laser, when we get the powerful ones, we won't, it won't be just we would, we can cut steel. And when we cut steel, we can cut it precisely and do it, and that will revolutionize the planet. <laughs> wow. Well, he was completely wrong in terms of what his idea was about that. It was completely wrong. It's completely, I mean, you know, yes, it's useful for that. But he was right that the laser revolutionized the planet, but for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah. He had it, so it was kind of interesting. And I was, I argued with him. I said, you you know, that I actually had it right as it happens. I said, that, I don't, how can that revolution, you know, sure it'll make steel, you can make things with steel much more accurately and do and so on. But he would never have guessed that, it, that you could do all the, I mean, we wouldn't better do this without it, but do all the marvelous things we do and all the, the digital uh, rubbish that we have lying around us, uh, would, none of it would, would be possible. And, and of course, even in terms of cutting things, you know, that we would do laser surgery on the eye and so on. Pretty amazing. But he had the right idea. He was right. That yeah, he did but he right. couldn't have imagined LIGO, for example. No, LIGO, yeah, I mean, LIGO. Yeah, I mean, that is, it's all marvelous. Isn't so it? Isn't it? So the thing is, you know, there's all these, there's, so going back to what I said, there's these unintended consequences because the, we did not, you know, the government did not realize the, that they were dealing with an integrated system. And they never do, by the way. Mm. That's why, yeah. you know, most of the things that we do politically in terms of policy end up screwing up has all these unintended consequences. Now, there's no way that you can avoid unintended consequences. But I do believe very strongly 
but by understanding more and more about complex adaptive systems and the kinds of things, just even some of the little things we've been talking about, we can mitigate the problems of unintended consequences. We can minimize them to some extent and really understand that. And COVID, COVID is another phenomenal example of, uh, of that, you know, the kinds of multiple effects. I mean, Jesus Christ, who could believe that the, the um, uh, evolution of some bloody little virus in Wuhan, China, could stop within a few months, football in Spain, not get a <laughs> flower in the United States, and, and so on, and all the various, you know, all the various things that, who would believe there was this connection? You know, you know, we didn't, no one foresaw that, but the fact of the matter is, believe it or not, in some bizarre, curious way, football being played in Spain or Chile or Argentina or anywhere is connected to the production of flour. Believe it or not, there is yeah. a connection because it is all interconnected. Now, most of the time, it's irrelevant. But sometimes it's powerful and almost direct. And this was one of them and we weren't able to deal with it. And so all and so not surprisingly, all the predictions by all the marvelous epidemiologists, of whom some are friends of mine, by the way, turn out to be wrong. Because <laughs> yeah. Think of it as a very, you know, it's a closed system. It yeah. is, it's all connected to all this other rubbish. Yeah. Uh, mostly, you know, social behavior and politics and so on and so forth. So in a way it's the same principle, isn't it? Like the, um, from complex systems emerges uh, something that we cannot foresee, uh, but maybe the understanding of complex adaptive systems will let us uh, predict the emergence of uh, uh, from some complex system. Yeah. So let me tell you, we, we we only touched on this, and I didn't pursue it in discussing what is complexity and could there be a theory of complexity, and I said very strongly, there couldn't be a theory of complexity in the usual sense. Now, what I meant by that, because that was the context we were talking, it can't be like Newton's laws. You know, you can't, there won't be an equation you write on the board. Yeah, even. this is how you build a perfect society. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, this is the formula. However, what I do foresee, and I think, uh, and I believe will come to pass, there will be a coarse grain theory. That is, and that's why I'm very excited about the work I've been involved in, that something like the scaling laws. There will be things like there are regularities and systematic behavior, and you can understand where they came from. You can understand mechanistically how they arose, and you can understand the parameters that govern them, but they're coarse grain. They're only sort of average quantities. Um, and there are deviations from them. And one of the things I didn't tell you about those deviations is that they also satisfy, this is amazing, we don't, I don't understand it. Those deviations typically also um, satisfy very simple mathematical laws. So that brings into play the possibility that the combination of this kind of coarse-grained traditional theory, traditional meaning that you can write it in mathematics, and use traditional mathematics, maybe new mathematics, to really manipulate those equations, understand them, make predictions. They will be also uh, be in the background of stochasticity, that you will have stochastic statistical fluctuations around it. And fed into that is all of the marvels of artificial intelligence and machine learning to aid that. So whereas artificial intelligence and machine learning of its own, I think is sometimes, well, it's going to be very powerful and sometimes extremely useful. I mean, we've already seen it, it's no question. For in general and longer term, I think it would be dangerous and almost certainly wrong probably to rely on it unless you integrate it with some kind of coarse grained theory along that line. So I could imagine this sort of bigger entity that would be the science of complex adaptive systems 
that would integrate all of this. And uh, so that's my view of it, but it would not be, therefore, it wouldn't be something that you could do sort of like classical mechanics and physics, write down, you know, one or two <laughs> equations. And in a certain sense, that encapsulates everything. You know, it's, um, you know, that, uh, it reminds me of something like there is, I once read this quote, which really struck me by a man named Rabbi Hillel, who said something that, that Jesus repeated, love thy neighbor as thyself is the content of the entire Bible. All the rest is commentary. <laughs> and I thought that was brilliant. You know, it sort of says it, you know, and in some sense it's right. You know, and I thought, God, that is that is an amazing insight. And um, uh, that's what I think about. So Newton's laws are like that. I mean, you know, mechanics. F equals M A and F equals G M1 M2 over R squared. The rest is commentary, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, of course, it's unbelievably complicated, right? I mean, so for example, let me give you another example. And I should have said that earlier. You know, I, I it turned out I, I had um, a period when I was interacting with Boeing aircraft because mm -hmm. they were very interested in our work. And so I got to know some of the stuff up there and they were just coming out with their 787, the, Dreamliner, I guess it was called. Lovely plane, this new plane. And um, uh, one of the things I realized, I saw uh, various aspects of this plane, and I realized, you know, it was unbelievably complicated. It was incredibly complicated, but it's not complex. It's actually simple. We would call that simple because there's like, you know, there's these books, there's a big book kind of thing that tells you how to make a Boeing 787. Which, so what does that mean? That means that in principle, any one of you could take that book and build a 787. <laughs> of course. Piece of cake. <laughs> there's a formula, it tells you, this is what you have to, you know, it's like a cookbook, right? Yeah. Tells you how to do it. Now it's like a cookbook. In principle, you could make great meals, but you know you have to be a great chef to actually do it properly. So you need it, all of this. So, and that's great. So it's simple. It's not complex. Now the thing about the 787 was that uh, Boeing kept losing an enormous amount of money because they kept thinking it was going to be built soon, and it wasn't because they kept running into all kinds of problems, all kinds of issues. And it, they were years delayed and very likely had it not had government support, it would have gone out of business, actually, I suspect. But um, if it were a you know, totally free market system, it would have collapsed. Now, why did that happen? Now, here's the reason, I believe, is that in do making that 787, they changed completely the way in which they, the kind of business plan for construction. So all Boeings up to that point were built in around Washington, mostly, uh, the state of Washington, Seattle. And, um, you know, they all knew each other, they all bring these bits together and so on, just like you make automatic. You know, of course, some bits came from elsewhere and so on. But globalization was the word in those days. And they decided to build it globally. So every piece of this bloody airplane was built somewhere. I don't know where you're sitting, but I suspect some piece of the Boeing 787 was built where you live. <laughs> yeah, it actually, does. And Querétaro, Querétaro has a lot of things from, yeah. uh, from Boeing. <laughs> yeah, so it was extraordinary. And when I saw that map, they showed me this map. And it was, you know, prior with great pride course because it is amazing and then i realized of course they screwed up because they had created this complex adaptive system without realizing it. they <laughs> built a network where everything depended upon everything else now so a little mistake someplace propagates through you know a little mistake 
in Colombia building something, then has an effect on what's happening in Japan, which then affects something being built in England. And so this whole thing gets out of whack. And that's what was happening. And they did not. And so Boeing, as I once said to one of their vice presidents, you are masters, true masters of simplicity, <laughs> which are complete bozos of complexity. <laughs> <laughs> But you didn't understand you had a complex system, but you created it. And so that's another example. Isn't there a famous saying in, in engineering, like build simple because complex yes. breaks? Exactly, yes. No, no, engineering, that's what's surprising about Boeing because they are superb engineers, otherwise their planes wouldn't fly. But uh, they, um, no, engineering, of course, is something that... Uh, one of the things that they do is they, so to speak, over-engineer. That's part of this, you know, first of all, you know, whatever the tolerances are, you multiply by 10 kind of thing. You know, you <laughs> make sure that, uh, um, you know, this thing is over-engineered so that something won't break. Um, or you, some, just a side comment again, you don't over-engineer and you make sure the thing will wear out in two years so people have to buy another one. I mean, that's the other side of that coin. But in something like an aeroplane, you want it to last a very long time and so on. And indeed, you want to keep it, when it's something like that, something as complicated as that, you want to keep everything relatively simple so that you don't run into this problem in terms of the engineering. So they understood that in terms of the actual mechanical, physical construction. But they hadn't realized in terms of the supply chains and the social interactions mm. between people, creating a hundred or whatever it was, different suppliers for this bloody thing is inviting problems, serious problems. So that caused them great grief. And uh, the plane turned out okay in the end. It took, I don't know how many years, five, seven years, too late. I forget exactly. So. Um, Wait just a second. I want to see. I think David, maybe you want to say something. Uh, oh, I, I, your microphone is not connected. No, you know what? I, I think it's not working. Okay, sorry. You know this commentary about the the Bible uh, strikes me because I I was. I was taking this class on on conductual biology, which talks about how uh, from really simple and really few laws of interaction between individuals amongst ants emerges an ant colony, which is a really complex system. Uh, and a human societies might be a bit like that. So maybe uh, uh, one of the ways we could like start using uh, the science of complexity to build better societies is to like regulate the l laws of interaction between individuals to see yes. whatever emerges from this new laws of interaction. Yes, that is actually, no, absolutely. And that is the basis of the theory behind the scaling laws that I talked about, social networks. They're universal and so on. And if you want to change things, you know, if you want to change something in terms of its manifestation, you have to realize that it's buried in the social networks. And so it's sort of kind of social and cultural changes need to be made. Um, so for, for example, in terms of, you know, changing people's habits about sustainability and, uh, you know, uh, being a, a little more conscious, or not a little more, in fact, that's not enough, much more conscious of uh, what we're doing to the environment, and what we're doing to ourselves. Um, and, um, it has to go back, you know, you can't just simply change that by, even by changing laws, that helps, but you have to do something that's deeper, and that's very hard to do, and that usually involves some cultural change of some kind And, uh, and and that's that I don't you know I'm, it's not my expertise I don't know but I feel very I, I have felt for a long time that that's why the, if we're going to have major change uh, you know then it has to come with um, some deep social or rather cultural social change in the networks for sure and and by the way what you said in opening your those, that statement 
was extremely important that uh, one of the extraordinary things and one of the things that gave credibility to uh, people, and in fact, the founding of the Center for Institute and, and, and creating, trying to create a science of complex systems was these very early, well, early meaning in the, even in the 70s, but in the 80s, these uh, computer simulations showing, you know, very simple rules, very trivial rules of the interaction between agents led to unbelievably complex behavior. And that was very surprising, you know, so it, it, it meant that, um, you know, my goodness me, underneath what seems like, you know, this incredibly chaotic and random and messy world actually lie some very simple rules. Yeah, can I like Conway's game of life, which is like literally three rules and, and from it emerges like complex structures. Sure, absolutely. So I think uh, that that was those those kinds of simulations were very important. Um, I think the realization, though, is that yes, there's simple rules, but they may not be algorithmic, as I said earlier, you know, they may not the, 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 the metaphor of the computer may not be quite right. But uh, nevertheless, the idea, the concept, is almost certainly correct. And indeed, I would say, you know, these scaling laws are another manifestation of that, that buried in that messiness out there is uh, structure. I mean, one of the things that I had a, <laughs> I mentioned earlier that I think of myself as having a spiritual component, <laughs> but one of my, uh, <laughs> one of my spiritual experiences, so to speak, was one of the pieces of work that uh, we did was trying to understand plants and trees and forests. And um, again, uh, the, uh, you know, network systems and uh, deriving from first principles, underlying principles uh, of networks, uh, the scaling laws and, and so on. And the scaling laws within a tree, how the tree scales is a fractal thing we talked about earlier, but also then how a tree scale between themselves and then how does the whole forest come together? So that work we did, and it was beautiful. And uh, it was fantastic to see the data, um, you know, fall on the predictions. And it, it was very satisfying, all kinds of interesting predictions about the structure of forests and the structure of trees in terms of their, um, you know, their, their spacing and their size of their canopies and uh, the energy they use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that was great, but the experience I had that was so wonderful was to take hike hikes through a forest. Was because you walk through a forest, and it looks so random. You know, there's big trees and little trees, and there's this, and there's that, and it just seems arbitrary, completely arbitrary and capricious. And I walk through that, and I suddenly I thought, oh my God, I don't think the trees realize that they're obeying these bloody laws. <laughs> actually, on the average, then in this coarse-grained way, they actually arrange themselves so that they're obeying these laws. Because we've measured them. We've done that. We've measured all these things that they obey the laws on the average. And that was just very deep and satisfying, I must say. And, uh, and science can do that. And it's... Uh, but it is a manifestation of complexes. So it, it gives hope that we might be able to understand some of the extraordinary challenges and complexities that we face. You mentioned in your book uh, a, a concept that just blew my mind. It gave me the kind of oceanic experience that, on, all, that only <laughs> the, the Gaia hypothesis uh, once gave me. And it is the metabolic theory of ecology. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes. I don't know if I don't like that phrase, by the way, but yes. I don't know if I understood understood it like correctly, but is it implying that an ecosystem has its own metabolism? Yes. Yes. So it applies sort of at all scales, and that was the idea of writing that down in a very simple way. That it applies at all scales, but not only that. The thing I I found so extraordinary was again in this coarse grained way at all scales across life, only two numbers are important. 
One is this number four, this one quarter, it comes right. from the network. This networks, you know, this number. And by the way, for those that don't know, um, it comes out of the networks, but the four is actually three plus one. And the three <laughs> is to do with the fact that we live in three dimensional space. And the plus one is one of those marvelous peculiarities of fractals that they sort of add a dimension to things. Um, you know, there's a technical way of doing that, but that's sort of the words that go along with it. Um, so um, it's, it's three plus one. And so if we lived in four dimensions, the number would have been five, five plus one and so on. So there's that number four, which governs sort of energy flow in some way. The other is um, a, no, a, a, a number that has units, that is the um, what's called the activation energy, the energy associated with the production of ATP, which is the molecule um, that is our currency of energy that is produced within our cells, and in fact, within the mitochondria of our cells, that is our currency of energy, um, which you are producing all the time and recycling it and is keeping you alive. And um, uh, but that, that, that number, uh, there's a number that, that governs on the average, uh, the uh, rate, the, the chemical reaction that produces it, the energy that's needed to produce it. And uh, that number for those that know the unit is about 0.7 electron volts. That may not mean anything to many people, but um, it's a number. And so those two numbers roughly, very roughly speaking, sort of constrain the biosphere around us. Um, now, you know, that just gives you the big picture. Then all the rest, you have to dig down to, there's all kinds of variation and deviations. But that's the, uh, that's, and that is what is encapsulated in what became known as the metabolic theory of ecology. There, um, there is a well statement in the book and is that uh, cities run on ATP. W yes. which, which absolutely changes like the priorities of, of, of uh, the energetic priorities we have right yeah. now, doesn't it? Did I, say, did I write that in the book? Yeah. <laughs> no, I say that until I didn't, I don't remember writing. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I forget what I wrote, what I didn't. Of course. <laughs> But I, I say that not very often. I say that uh, the fundamental unit of energy for a city is actually... <laughs> 0.7 electron volts. It's the production of uh -huh. and, and talking about this, I wanted to bring the conversation to a statement that I've seen you say in a couple of your talks online uh, that I've seen uh, that, you know, the future of the planet depends on cities. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I, I just want to make sure that we're uh, be respectful of your time. So I'm so. going to stop very soon because it's getting, I mean, it must be, it must be. You're all in some part of Latin America, I assume. So no, we're actually oh, in no, California. You're, well, you're, in you're an hour earlier. Yeah. Some of you might be later. Yeah. So I maybe just later. But I'm at 10 o'clock. Believe it or not, at my age, that's my bedtime. Uh, and I will be going to bed, even though it's Friday night. <laughs> yeah. No, then, then let's, just, let's just leave it there. Because just to, to maybe some close remarks and... Uh, say that this has been unbelievable. This is so, so cool that you gave us this time and uh, this has been a very interesting conversation. And to those listening to us, I think, you know, you should check uh, uh, Geoffrey's book. Like it's really one of those transformative experiences to realize completely strange phenomena seem to be connected in a deep way that we still don't, don't know how to, to, solve, to a large extent. So a lot of open questions, a lot of interesting things to, to think about. So for, you know, if you're interested in math, physics, those are the kind of questions that are kind of hot nowadays. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. This has been so cool and, and so inspiring. Thank you a lot. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and I've enjoyed the conversation very much. And, um, uh, you know, thanks for uh, listening and Uh, I've got, and, and, by, and thanks also, I'm very flattered that you all enjoyed the book. Uh, I enjoyed writing it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, it shows. I, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. That's also a very nice comment. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, uh, 
and I wish you all well in your careers, in your your at the beginning, you know. Yeah, thanks so much. It was Lots awesome. of wonderful things to work on, to think about. But I, I would say, I want to finish with one thing, because it's sort of obvious. Inevitably, you know, in your work, whatever you work on, you work on specific problems, and they're, you know, you, you, you that's the way, that's the only way we can do things, mostly. And, uh, you know, and I've certainly spent my career doing incredibly detailed problems and calculations. And, and uh, what, I, what I would like, I, I just like to sort of emphasize that even though you have to do that and it'll be incredibly enjoyable and so on, don't lose sort of the big picture. I think keeping in mind why you're doing those, it's very easy to do. And I say that for someone that did it various times. I got so involved in certain problems. I forgot why I was doing them, in, you know, really. And then I began to realize, you know, and you do, you do do that. So keeping in mind some of the the, the, the big the, the question that you're really the bigger question that you're involved in and then even more than that keep open some of these big I know high school sophomoric questions about you know life and the meaning of life and why and all the rest just keep asking why it's good even if you never answer them and no one uh -huh. can answer them. <laughs> that's why we're here I believe so do it <laughs> Fantastic. Thank so you. Good. Thank okay. you so much. You go to bed and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so thank much you. for this thank conversation. You so much. It was amazing. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Bye. 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 Bueno, eso fue una conversación, ah. eh. Ya estamos, estamos en vivo todavía o ya no? Seguimos sí, en vivo. Oh, ya. ya me voy a poner a... A ver si eres más como el, el, el abuelo Simpson, pero versión súper sabio. <risa> Danos todo su conocimiento. No, hombre. No, in increíble, sí. Este, ¿Hay algunos super chats que quieras leer? Uh, el de Lázaro Marín no lo voy a leer porque es muy grosero. <risa> pero, este... Bueno, Diego Rivera dice, hoy no me puedo quedar, pero vengo a pegar el podcast, chingón de los invitados con que salen en este canal. Hoy estuvo muy chingón el invitado, tiene razón Diego Rivera, hoy fue una gran conversación. Eh, Irving Luna Mata dice, llevo dos meses siendo Patreon y ya se me ha hecho costumbre donar en los porcentajes. Escuchar este contenido y poder leer las crónicas del barrio, eh, ha valido cada centavo, gracias. Y Ernesto Guzmán tiene una pregunta para el señor West. Bueno, le dice Mr. West, como si fuera Kanye. Este... <risa> Dice, ¿qué consejo le darías a las generaciones más jóvenes para entender la complejidad del mundo, así como sus problemas y encontrar soluciones? A mí me gustó mucho su último comentario, que no importa cuán específicos sean nuestros problemas, siempre mantengamos en mente el gran, the big picture, el gran panorama. Sí, creo que la contestó a la perfección, porque, pues así, o sea, en el que ser científico siempre te tienes que enfocar en tu sistemita, así, por ejemplo, que, eh, no sé, Dani estudia este bicho específico que procesa azufre de alguna manera, y a veces es fácil como decir, oye, pero ¿por qué ese bicho específico? O yo, ¿por qué estoy estudiando este evol proceso evolutivo en levadura? Pero mientras mantengas una vista amplia de cómo se conecta tu, tu epsilon extra que das de conocimiento al quehacer humano, a, 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 en qué parte del rompecabezas se ajusta, creo que le puedes dar significado. Y, y, y también como, o sea, muchas de las cosas que decía cuando hablábamos de, de, de Bell Labs, este lugar fantástico, nunca, nunca vas a predecir cómo vas a cambiar el mundo. La invención del transistor, que es en lo que se basa toda la computación digital hoy en día, eran experimentos en eh, física del estado condensado y del estado sólido, y no tenía nada que ver con, ah, de aquí vamos a poder implementar las computadoras de Turing eh, de manera más eficiente. Era simplemente, oye, ¿qué onda con estos este, elementos que se comportan como conductores y aislantes dependiendo de condiciones? Y eso, o sea, nos tiene hoy en día en una explosión de innovación in incomparable, ¿no? Entonces, siempre saber que hay un, un big picture y que tienes que trabajar en el small picture, ahora sí que fractálicamente, no olvidarte que tu pequeño problema se conecta a la escala grande, 
es, es bien, bien importante. Me encantó esa reflexión de, de Jeffrey. Sigo bajando a la tierra de, de la conversación. Porque sí estaba como muy, muy big picture. Sí, habló de la muerte, de sus propias... La experiencia espiritual que él siente al, al, al hacer ciencia. Este... Es que sí hay como una... Hay, hay un... No sé, hay como una... No lo quiero llamar experiencia espiritual, pero sí hay como una recompensa del organismo cuando nos damos cuenta de que los mismos procesos de optimización de redes están ocurriendo en todas las escalas. Hubo varias veces en las que me contuve para no decir as above, so below. <risa> sí. sí. Por eso no. Me... A ver. no, adelante, adelante. Por eso me permite tener como un buen... Enten... Digo, entiendo un montón de... de... De cosas obviamente, pero cuando habla de la muerte, uh, de las religiones como de donde nacen, creo que tiene razón, ¿no? O sea, porque nacen tal vez como del, del hecho de que no podemos enfrentar la muerte. Es algo, no sé, tú vives y quieres a tu mamá mucho, no sé, y se muere, y necesitas, o sea, no puede ser simplemente que se vaya y ya desaparezca, ¿no? Debe, de, debe haber quedado como algo. Entonces, como todo esto, como hemos... Uh, hecho sentido de la muerte a través de la historia de la humanidad, creo que tiene mucho que ver con cómo evolucionan las religiones y tal. Um, y sí, interesante que todo eso se intersecte con biología y <ríe> podemos como ¿sí? hablar de escalas. Es que justo cuando habla de muerte en el libro hace como un big flex, donde dice como, sí, Platón y todos ellos se preguntaron acerca de la muerte, pero es la ciencia la que nos puede dar respuestas reales. Y, y en cierto sentido tiene razón, aunque sí. siento que cambió un poco su discurso ahora, ¿no? Porque ahora era como, eh, bueno, la ciencia no puede responderte. Sí, entonces sí. la versión un poco más, más joven. Pero sí, ¿qué, qué conversación. De nuevo, ha sido todo un privilegio poder compartir estas conversaciones con... Tanto con lo que nos escuchan y con, con ustedes ha sido realmente increíble. Ojalá que podamos seguir haciendo estas pláticas y hablar con más gente así, porque pues, estos son los históricos, los que van cambiando la manera en que pensamos, en nuestro lugar en el universo, qué significa estar vivo y para qué, a qué dedicar tu vida y demás. Esta clase de conversaciones y ahora registradas en el internet Aquí está, para ¿no? revisitarlas. Para revisitarlas. Pronto Pero con no. subtítulos. Ah, sí, pues hay que... ¿Vas a pedirle al... o ya tienes quien lo traduzca o que alguien se ofrezca de los que...? Hay un chico de Twitter que generalmente me ayuda con los subtítulos. Le voy a decir si está disponible para este. Perfecto. Pues listo. Ahora sí que todos los que están escuchando y son Patreons, voten por el de evolución. Ese podcast tiene que ocurrir. Voten por el tema de la evolución para el próximo... Eh, sí, perdón que para los, todos los Patreons que no hubo podcast esta noche, pero, pero esto tenía que ocurrir. Sí, no, está, no. No nos podíamos perder esta, este privilegio. Sí, no. Enorme. Este... Pero bueno, gracias a todos los que se quedaron. Eh, espérenlo pronto con subtítulos y nos vemos. No me olvides de Big Picture. <risa> Bye. No sé. Bye. 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 Sorry, don't think.